guys welcome back to the channel sorry i've been gone for a few weeks but after that intense nine weeks of repair in the uh, plascada workshop uh, i thought i'd take a little bit of a break for a few weeks so just to collect myself and i've had a hell of a lot to do to be honest there's a lot of broke projects still to do and i've been working a lot trying to get them all done and i haven't had that much time for filming anyway this year is going to be a really exciting year for us because we're going to be moving on to the boat in the summer at least and um, we can't live on the boat in the uh, in the winter in sweden it's just too damn cold this summer we're going to be cruising around exploring the stockholm archipelago and maybe a bit further as well it's going to be super exciting for us and i'm, I'm really looking forward to that but that presents a few uh, challenges in itself and that's why I wanted to talk to you today about all the, well some of the electronic products I'm going to install on the boat. But I'll go over all of this in the next couple of episodes so you'll, you'll see how everything is hanging together. Anyway, let's get started. The first thing that I'm going to introduce to you here is our 4G router. Now there's many different options out there what you can go with. Um, I think Glomex are doing a few options. Um, but in my opinion, they're a little bit overpriced. Digital Yacht, I think, are doing a few good solutions there as well. I was tempted to go with the Digital Yacht solution uh, for the 4G connection because they have uh, big antennas that you can mount on the uh, two spreaders, either side of the mast. And with those antennas, um, you can get an extremely long range out to sea to get a 4G internet connection, up to 20 miles, I think. The only thing is, when we're sailing around the Baltic here, we're not going to be out to sea for a very long period of time or anything like that. And I can live without the internet, uh, to be honest, for, you know, for a certain period of time. The problem that we have here in Stockholm is the fact that we anchor a lot in very small bays and small anchorages and the rocks go um, up enough so that it blocks all the signal from a mobile phone. And the issue with using a mobile phone um, for a hotspot or something like that is that uh, the transmitters on them are very small. So, I mean, the 4G base stations out there and the masts and everything, they're just blasting out and broadcasting 4G signal, right? But the phones, they only have a very small transmitter in them. So, um, in order to be able to send and receive data, you also need to be able to transmit as well. And that is the limitation there with the mobile phones. So hence why you get something called a cell booster, they call it in the US, or we would call it a, a signal booster, um, which basically has bigger antennas on it. This is so that the transmitter can transmit out at a uh, higher power, basically, to communicate with all of the base stations more easily. Um, the reason that I didn't go with the digital yacht solution was the fact that it's only cat 4. I wanted the faster internet, basically. So I ended up choosing this uh, device here. Uh, it's a Cat6 um, 4G router as well. I know that the 5G is coming out now, but I don't think it will be that practical for yachts and things like that because 5G uh, really won't go or transmit as far as 4G will. And 4G can carry plenty of bandwidth, I can tell you that. And the other reason I didn't want to go with the digital yacht solution was the fact that you have to run um, if you want to run the cables over seven meters, you have to run with the LM400 cable, which is like, I don't know, the size of your thumb or something like that. And you have to get that all the way up through the coach roof, uh, up through the mast, and then across to the spreaders as well. And it's a bit more of an involved solution because you're running with those big antenna cables, basically. And the reason why you have to run with the big antenna cables is that you don't get that much signal loss, right? The problem with the distance with the running antenna cables is you need more copper basically to avoid that signal loss. The real advantage here is that I'm gonna install this router um, up the top of the mast. So the router will essentially have very small antenna cables uh, running to its um, dual MIMO antennas uh, and there'll only be a Cat5, or in this case a Cat7 cable, um, running all the way from the router to the boat. So there'll be no signal loss at all. Um, all of the work will be carried out at the top of the mast, and I can run this cable with power in it as well. So let's have a look at the uh, device itself. So this, uh, this enclosure here is actually separate. Um, it's fully weatherproof and everything like that, so all you have to do is buy the, well, I bought the Teltonica RTX09. There's really good reviews on there. It's a very robust unit. 
Um, there's no fans or anything like that to break up there in it and it's just going to sit in this uh, enclosure and do its thing basically. Like I said, it's a Cat6 4G device, so it'll do up to 300 megabytes a second. If you Google around for an enclosure for this uh, Teltonica RTX09, you'll find this little guy, and it's really a nice solution. The router sits in there, it clips in, it's gonna be very solid and secure. And then they also give you all of the cables to connect, uh, the ethernet cable as well, it just all plugs in, and off you go, you're ready to connect to the internet. Well, almost. There's a few things to do before you need to do that. There's some configuration. Anyway, the beauty of this is you can uh, use, like I said, some uh, ethernet cable basically to run this up the mast. You only need one cable here because you can use uh, what's called PoE or power over ethernet. Power over ethernet allows you to run power over pins uh, four and five and seven and eight directly to the device so that you can uh, basically avoid the need for uh, running a 12 volt cable as well. I'm gonna try this out. I was tempted to run the 12 volt cable anyway, but um, I'm pretty sure the power over ethernet is gonna be more than good enough. Now to do the power over ethernet connections, um, you need a power injector for the cable basically. And this is a PoE injector. Um, which basically puts power, like I said, on pins four and five, seven and eight, and it puts power on whatever you give it. There are standards out there, I think it's AF and AT. They will negotiate, depending on which pins are good and, and how good the cable is, they will negotiate how much power they can deliver. But this solution, um, Teltonica, just accepts a dumb power input, basically. In this case, I will uh, power it using 12 volt, um, so basically you connect your 12 volt connections here, it injects the power um, into your PoE port and this will go up the mast um, and then you'll connect your other router or other switch uh, into this one on your normal LAN inside the boat. Now, like I said, I'm fully aware with this unit that I might not get the range like the digital yacht solution that I was looking at and I spoke to those guys actually and they were very kind uh, to offer me a deal or something. In the end, because we're cruising locally around here, um, I need the speed more than I need the range. So I ended up with this solution and I think it could be really cool. And the, also the advantage with this is that I can put it right at the top of the mast, giving me the maximum height available because some of the islands are fairly tall but if I put it at the top of the mast, I can get over most of the islands in the archipelago. And also, if I'm in a marina, uh, a lot of the interference with a 4G signal comes from other boat masts. So essentially, because our mast is fairly tall on a 40 foot boat, I'll be getting over most of that single signal interference and uh, we're gonna have a really good 4G connection. There's also the options out there as well where you can get Wi-Fi boosters so you can, um, uh, boost the signal from any marina or a cafe that you stop nearby or anything like that but I couldn't see um, the purpose for me in doing that we're not going to be stopping at many Wi-Fi places so yeah I didn't bother with that solution I'm just gonna go with the 4G it does have a dual SIM card option this one as well so that uh, depending on your coverage if you're running with two different networks or if you're going crossing from one country to another and you want to be able to um, switch between the data plans there, you can do that. Or it's for redundancy as well, just in case one network goes down, you've got the other network. But this isn't a mission critical device for me, so it's not strictly necessary, it's just really nice to have internet on a boat really. In Sweden, 4G is pretty damn good, 5G is just coming onto the market now, but I really didn't bother with the 5G. Anyway, the next thing you're going to have to think about is actually mounting the antenna, right? And I bought this uh, Glomex um, adapter here, or Glomex uh, mount. Uh, but this really, really isn't going to be strong enough. And it's got the wrong mountings and everything for this application on mounting this thing. It's really meant for uh, mounting antennas, and I was going to try and modify this in the right way, but I don't think this would be strong enough. This is quite, um, it's got quite a lot of windage on it and it also weighs about two kilos as well. So you want something really solid to be able to mount it on. Hence why I ended up with this one. Now this is actually a TV um, bracket here. 
Uh, it's made for mounting the domes, basically, what you get the TV reception devices on, basically. Um, but the outdoor enclosure here also comes with an antenna bracket, so I've modified it a little bit and I've put the antenna bracket around the um, pole at the end there, you can see, and uh, hopefully this is going to be a really nice solution. So this will sit uh, on the front of the mast there, uh, you can see the you've got the V, the mast will come in here um, and then we're going to pop rivet that in so it's going to make a really strong mount. Definitely strong enough to hold two kilos I think. I've just got to chop the ends off there a little bit. One more thing that you're going to have to think about when you're uh, putting any electrical device up the mast or anything like that is you're going to have to think about terminating the connection just below the coach roof there so that when you remove the mast and put it back on, um, you can just reconnect them and disconnect them from there. You do not want to run a cable all the way down the mast and all the way through the boat and then to find out that you've got to take the mast off at one point. Probably uh, common sense, but I just thought I'd mention that anyway because I didn't think about it at first anyway until I really started looking at it and think, thinking, okay, I've got to do something there. With the network cable, um, there's three types of uh, RJ45 cable that you can buy, uh, Ethernet cable in other words. There's uh, Cat5 cable, Cat6 cable and Cat7. Cat5 is an unshielded cable and will do in most applications. It's thinner so it's easier to bend round things and, and run sometimes. But like I said it is unshielded so that means if you're running it past any pa uh, large power sources or running it next to any um, power cables, especially 230 volt cables, you know, something with a large uh, magnetic interference around it, it could interfere with the signal and you could then drop from um, like one gigabit to 100 megabits a second, like from full to half duplex, which could be a bit annoying for you. So then you move on to CAT6, which has a shield around the outside, which uh, generally tends to reduce this interference, so you can get a really good connection um, between both ends. But now, more recently, um, this is CAT7, and it means that all of the eight pairs inside of the cable are individually shielded. It also means that you can go from uh, one gigabit to 10 gigabits uh, a second, um, but it's not really strictly necessary for uh, normal pleasure vessels, so I wouldn't worry about that. But I went with CAT7 anyway, because it's, it's not exactly expensive to buy a pre-made cable nowadays. Uh, with CAT7. I think this was something like 20, um, 18 or 20 euros for a 20 meter cable, so it, it's not the end of the world. And you may as well uh, go belt and braces, right? The only thing I'm going to have to do uh, is terminate the connection. Because, it'll, because the cable will run through the compression post on the boat, um, I'm going to need to cut one end off of this and uh, remake the cable. You can buy CAT6 termination kits uh, really cheaply on Amazon or something like that and uh, you can buy just the connectors. And it's, it's not too difficult to make a CAT5 or CAT6 cable, to be honest with you, um, and make the termination on that yourselves. Okay guys, so I know I'm rambling on a bit here now, but one last thing to talk about here is um, you want a connected boat, right? which means that if you're sat at home um, and this stays on on your boat, how are you gonna connect to this device and have a look at, you know, you might wanna see how much water you've got on the boat or what the temperatures are or what the voltages are, whether the AC is on or whether it's off. Um, and to do that, you're gonna need a secure access tunnel to this router, right? It's also called a VPN. Um, this is so that no one else can log into your boat and start changing things and start doing things, right? You need to keep that connection secure. So to set up a VPN, there's a few different ways of doing it, and this is actually what I do for a living, really. Um, not specifically VPNs, but I, I install uh, certificate authorities, digital certificate authorities for a living um, uh, for governments and large enterprises, basically, in case you're interested. But anyway... To set up a VPN here, um, you're going to have to do more or less the same thing. You're going to have to set up a certificate authority, you're going to have to set up a client and a server certificate as well, along with some uh, Diffie-Hellman parameters. Now I know I'm going into a lot of technical details here, there's many instructions on how to do this online. If you're on Windows, there's many applications that you can use to generate a CA and the certificates and everything, and then you can get your VPN set up. There's many tutorials online 
but all you have to do is get your service certificate on the uh, router here, get your client certificate on the on your laptop or whatever, get some VPN software such as um, Tunnelblick or Viscosity or there's many different options out there. Um, and then you can start making the connection and basically when you click on that VPN icon on your computer uh, and then you click connect, uh, you'll connect to your boat and then you can essentially start jumping around the network from there. So whether you have, like with me, I've got a Victron Servo device, I've got um, uh, a few other bits and pieces as well that are all connected to the network so I could just go in and log in there and then uh, see exactly what's going on on my boat. If you connect this device to a DDNS server externally, um, a dynamic domain name service server, uh, it will essentially, you'll essentially be able to find it because it will reference the IP to the domain name so you can then make the VPN connection based on this. If you're interested in the setup of the VPN, um, maybe I can do a separate technical session on this and I can really go through the details on it. Leave a comment if this is something that you're interested in. Um, otherwise, yeah, there's there's many, uh, many resources online to do this, like I said. Essentially, that's it. Now, this is completely untested by me um, in regards up the mast and what it's gonna be like on the boat. So it's gonna be an interesting experiment this year. This video hasn't been sponsored in any way by Teltonica or anything. This is something that I've gone out and bought myself, so it's gonna be a completely independent evaluation. Um, but it's gonna be really cool, I think. It's gonna enable us to get the internet all the way around the Stockholm archipelago, and it's gonna make our lives a bit easier, and it's gonna make it a bit nicer as well. We're gonna be able to watch Netflix, do whatever we want in the evenings as well. The device itself, uh, I think its maximum power input is about 9 watts, so it's not too bad actually. You, you probably need to be aware of it if you have smaller uh, batteries, for sure, but it's not too bad. One other cool feature of this device actually is it has a uh, GPS connector here as well. So basically you can log into this device um, and then track it as well, so it, it could act as a security device. One thing that you would have to think about there though is making it not so obvious that people can turn it off, right? That's one thing that I would suggest, so that it will always remain on, so in case someone does steal your boat or anything like that, uh, you can track it down. You can actually send an SMS to this device as well, and it will reply back uh, with the GPS coordinates, so I think that's super awesome as well. There's a lot of features to this device, and it's a really professional router, actually. There's a lot of features there, VPNs, VLANs, syslog, shipping, ed everything is on this device. Yeah, so that's it guys. It's all installed, all riveted on, ready to go. And um, yeah, just gotta connect it down the bottom end uh, tomorrow or maybe in the next few days. There's no rush on that. As long as we're ready to fit the mast on the boat, then the rest can be done later. But uh, let's test it out over the next few weeks and see if it works well. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be a good solution. Thanks for watching. As always, if you have any questions or comments, leave it down below. And uh, if you liked the video, drop us a like. Thanks very much. See you next time. Take care, guys. Bye now.